Okay, welcome back everyone. Cube's live coverage at Red Hat Summit, Boston, Massachusetts. We're here, day one coming to an end. We're doing keynote reviews as well as insights from the day. I'm John Furrier, host of the Cube. My co-host this week, Paul Gillen. Great to see you, and Rob Stretch, analyst, breaking down all the action. Rob, great to see you. Guys, thanks for, for, for being here in day one, packed. The CEO came on twice. IBM Consulting came out, a lot of great guests and customers. Full day tomorrow. Thanks for coming on. Pleasure to be here, John. Great to see great you. Great coverage. Uh, great editorial. Love your articles, Paul, on siliconangle.com. I retweeted a bunch of them. I noticed that, thank you. Very good job. I'm still not growing my followers. <laughs> <but. laughs> we'll help you on that one. <laughs> you're, you're a legend. <laughs> Rob, great, great analysis so far. Let's go start with the keynotes, Rob. You attended the keynotes um, in its entirety. I had to jump out early to get the first interview off. What's your take on the keynote analysis from Red Hat today? I, I think it's it, a big thing and a big theme is how to make it simpler for the end users. How to get people into cloud, into Kubernetes, into OpenShift in particular, easier. And how they went through Developer Hub, so how do you bring people into Ansible? So it had a lot to do with automation. I think some of the guests even today, and Paul and I were talking, we were talking about hyper automation and number of things. And I think they're playing really well into that. Uh, also, the service interconnect, uh, networking's hard in cloud. Service interconnect makes it easier at a le le layer seven view. Uh, and I think that uh, light speed, and event-driven Ansible, and being able to do that really is to kind of unburden people as well. Yeah, I think if you look at the announcements of the show, you're right on the, on the mark, Rob. It's all about simplification. I mean, Lightspeed is about that, event-driven Ansible, uh, the developer hub, this is all about making life easier for people, whether they be end users or developers. And of course, Red Hat has a developer focus, and a lot of the news that came out of here today was, uh, was music to the ears of those who build software. You know, Paul, that's a great point. I mean, if you think about Ansible, small little company that they bought, their whole culture's automation. Yeah. <laughs> they live, breathe automation. And then it's a small little niche, that whole configuration management, you know, was a small, but now that's grown, they're shutting down and folding in Ansible Fest. I thought that was a real nuanced signal that that's coming into the fold. They used to have their own event, now it's here. That's a big, and they, they were dominating most of the thematic content yeah. on right. the yeah. keynote. Quite different from, from minimizing Ansible, they made Ansible the, start, the star of the yeah. show today, and I think they're realizing that this is a, they have a prime opportunity because IT, the IT landscape is getting so complex, and we have so many tools to manage, manage it, but so few tools to actually automate it. Uh, they see Ansible as a strategic way to bring some uh, to, to simplify the lives of people who have to manage these extraordinarily complex networks. Rob and Paul, love to get your thoughts on on the guardrails comment. I was on the panel, and you know, I ranted about it day because, and, and you know, the we're going to put down guardrails and regulate. But guardrails can be good. You can bounce around the guardrails. I mean, when I play bowling now, I put the I put the gut, <laughs> I don't want to throw a gutter, gutter ball. I, I put the I put the rails up, and the ball bounces around. I get a strike once in a while. Yeah. But that's a good metaphor to think about how to accelerate AI with a partner. So this idea of open collaboration is interesting, now of course open source and Red Hat go hand in hand, yeah. but this, the AI hype is actually legit in their minds and, it, and, and the question is what is a guardrail? How do customers navigate it? Because in these new markets, simplicity, reducing the time it takes to do something, and the steps it takes, that was, that's a killer business model in these new markets. Yeah, and I, I think even it ties even back to the whole wanting to own multi-cloud, hybrid cloud, every cloud, be everywhere, and open source winning and being there. I think that why it ties back with their OpenShift AI is the fact that they love to talk about the fact that there was no YAML uh, used in the demo for that when they <laughs> showed that tying back did, to the Did bot. they call they, that out? They did, <laughs> okay. and then the next, the next exact demo actually had YAML in it, but it was showing <laughs> how you could actually use prompt engineering to then, with their uh, writing of it, using AI. So I, I think they're also looking for it to be hybrid because nobody knows where is AI going to really live in all that data. Your point about guardrails, John, you know, CIOs have been through this process before. They've seen the hype, the hype cycle, uh, client server, you know, the, the web 1.0, and, and, and the stuff that, that people get giddy about 
and then they are the ones who actually have to make it work, and they know how hard that is. And guardrails help in that case. What we're, we're at right now is there is just a frenzy around AI uh, and ChatGPT and whatever may come out of that. And I think that what I hear CIOs saying is they're asking tough questions. Can we rely on this stuff? How do we govern the data? Uh, how do we make sure it doesn't go off the rails? Uh, they want guardrails, they want guidelines, and they want applications that are actually going to have business value to the organization, otherwise they risk just spinning off into science experiments. Paul, that's great insight, and the folks watching, Paul's seen these waves of innovation, and I think this, and he's covering the stories now. I want to ask you a question, I think you could really kind of unpack this in a way that's uniquely skilled to your experience. Yeah, we, we're both been around the block. No, I'm times. an old guy. <laughs> <laughs> hey, when I hear words in these interviews like, okay, I'm going to build a horizontal layer between the Azure stack and Amazon. Reminds me of like the old gateways. Remember that when you know, IBM and DEC had proprietary protocol stacks? You'd have to kind of create a gateway to make apps run across them. So when I hear multi-cloud, I kind of get like a gut, ugh, wrenching feeling like, is it going to be slow? Is that really viable? And to your point about CIOs being sold something, oh, I want, the, the, I want to buy the dream. Implementation is different than actually getting there. What's your, what's your vision of an experience and looking at this market, knowing what's happened in the past, what can we learn from to call out what, what's right and what's wrong, what's BS, what's legit? Well, I, I, think, I think it's telling. We recently ran a, a couple of articles on what Walmart is doing with its super cloud, where it's, it's tying these multiple public clouds together, and it went and built its own abstraction layer to do that. Right, there were lots of vendors who said that they could deliver that functionality, but Walmart went and built it itself. And I think that says a lot about the state of the market. Again, there's a lot of hype, there's a lot of promises. When you get down to making this stuff work, uh, it always yeah. falls back to, to homegrown, to a lot of homegrown code. That's a good, and by the way, they, they have the problem, they're living the problem. The vendor selling the software probably doesn't live the problem. Yeah. <laughs> Rob, now conversely, Dave Vellante is looking at Uber. See, Walmart's a great example. We've written about that extensively. Dave's doing work with George Gilbert on Uber and looking at how the data met, how they handled the data layer. Right, yeah, data So similar is, kind of dynamic. They've got a lot of stuff on open source, but now people are trying to figure out what the architecture is for data across clouds. Yeah. And so yeah. this is really an architectural conversation. What's your take? It's also a governance thing and a compliance thing as well. And I, I think, uh, and it was talked about, and I think the multi-cloud makes sense, especially for sovereignty. And you're seeing this, especially in Europe. I mean, we, we've talked about it uh, before, but Google Analytics has been outlawed in five countries in the EU. So when you start to look at where data is, who's the right to be forgotten, GDPR, CCPA in California, and you start to look at all these data meshes and how things come together, it is, data has weight and gravity, but it also has regulation it brings with it. And I think AI is just going to make that such a, a almost untenable problem for people that they have to figure out, which is why people are looking into it and saying, okay, what data goes where? How do I do summarization? How do I do you know, some inference at the edge? And I think edge is going to become so that much more important. The question is, how and what should regulate? Michael Dell was on theCUBE today. I was watching yeah. Dave's interview while I was taking a break when you guys were carrying some interviews. Uh, I, he, I, Michael Dell said he thinks there'll be regulation around AI. Should AI be regulated, and, and when? Absolutely, and <laughs> it has to be. <laughs> I mean, the, the potential disasters, we haven't begun to see uh, the, the real AI disasters that are, that are lurking in our future. Uh, you know, when you look at, again, ChatGPT being the example everyone is using, the, the examples of, of that utility going off the rails and doing crazy stuff are Proven. legend, <laughs> are legend <laughs> at this point. And, and that's a fairly safe environment because it's not operating equipment in a hospital, it's not, yeah. it's not managing you know, traffic lights. People's lives are not being affected by, by that yet. But when you look at the potential, AI is, the, is such a black box that we're going to need rules about, how, uh, about the data that we yeah. put in there, about transparency, about how decisions are made. Uh, there's going to have to be audit trails. Uh, you bring up a good point, you bring up a good point actually on the whole um, hallucination thing and, and getting off the rails. Not only is that a problem, by the way, I have a different opinion on the regulation. I think it's how it's get regulated. I think it's a standards issue, but we'll, we'll, we can debate that. But I want to just say, I've noticed that people right now are, having, are actually having fun 
driving manipulation to get the hallucinations. Yes. Okay, that to me is a completely tell sign. That means they're, it's like war games. Right? It's like, I'm going to go, <laughs> I'm going to just hack that thing. I'm going to make that car crash. Oh, look what I just did. I just killed five but people. But thank goodness yeah. they're doing it, yeah. right? Because yeah. that's how you find, that's how you find the bugs. So, so the, it is a black box, and, but the question is, should the, who should regulate it? Should it be standards body? So again, there isn't, it's not an IEEE standard. There's not, there's no, yeah. who, who does it? But I, I look, um, well, I think, I think what'll be IETF? interesting. I think there's a lot of different bodies that are pushing open source with AI, right? Yeah. And we talked to a few just a couple weeks ago at the open source summit. And I, I think when you start to look at where people are trying to put those guardrails up around AI, I don't know if it comes from regulation, from standards body, or from the fact that it becomes so pervasive and transparent in an open source way. Um, I don't know what the right answer is, but I, I think it's going to go to open source for Brown. But you make a good point. I think, uh, to John's point, the regulation is going to actually going to come from the companies that use it they are going to establish their own ethical guidelines and we will see, they'll publish those guidelines, they'll be broadly adopted. I think we'll see good companies realize that they, they have their reputational disasters, yeah. uh, their potential reputational disasters if their AI models go off the rails. And so they have every interest in doing this right. Yeah, it's almost like, it's almost like a hack almost. It could be company killing. And we were riffing Paul on the Cube in, in Vancouver and a little bit at KubeCon and comparing the Twitter moment where the plane landed on the Hudson. And I think AI needs to have that moment where you know the, something happens, people go, wow. And I think what's scary about it is it's, it's not like the plane landing on the Hudson, which actually was a safe, they actually saved people thanks to the pilot, but this could be a disaster. It could be uh, uh, a disaster with critical infrastructure. It could be uh, some big takeover, some cause some real harm. So like, I think part of me is waiting for that moment and then everyone's going to wake up and go, okay, this is out of control. Because it is hot right now. People are pumping out code, they're testing stuff. This, I just read an article about uh, test data. People are putting bad test data in, yep. into the large language models. This is causing um, uh, contamination. They use the word contamination, yes. which we were saying cloud pollution. pollution. <laughs> yeah. and we were saying code pollution <laughs> at, yeah. at KubeCon, which was like, what are, like, you're like, what are you talking about? Well, <laughs> contamination, you know, yeah. it's like bad stuff can get in and that's only going to hurt. Yeah, and I, I think it, it's only going to get worse because I think people don't don't know if they put something in there and they're trying to use AI for customization of you know uh, things that they want to sell you, like all the spooky ad stuff. When you start to look at that, well, in what country, where was it collected from, and when you're training that model, what data are you using to actually train it? And I think it becomes a hey, well if I make fake data and I put that fake data into the model, what happens when the real data goes into the model <laughs> at that point? Right, well I think what, what we'll see is we're going to see a lot of vertical use cases and an example with Lightspeed announced at this conference is an example of that where they've yeah. taken generative AI, they've populated the model, trained the model on uh, uh, data that relates directly to systems management. Yeah. And they can control that data set, they can control the output, they make the, the outputs explicit as, as YAML playbooks, and I think that's the way yeah. you go about it. And I think it, to your exact point of what you said about the company self-regulating, also at the bottom of the demo, what was really neat is they showed all of the licenses and where the data came from that came up with that YAML file. And I think you know it said, hey, this is actually using a GPL3 license, mm. Okay, well, GPL may or may not be good for me if, if it's not Apache versus MIT and all these licenses and having to know them all again is is really going to be complicated for people. And I think that's I think it's going to get way more complicated before it gets any easier. So, just reading some of the news headlines today, Spotify is developing AI tools trained on its host's voices to create targeted ads, according to Bill Simmons, founder of Spotify's podcast network, The Ringer. On SiliconANGLE, besides your awesome article, uh, Paul, here's the headlines on SiliconANGLE. Dave's breaking analysis. The AI-powered hybrid multi-super cloud. Love that one. <laughs> Michael Dell talks about <laughs> the power. How many prefixes can we add to <laughs> cloud? Okay, <laughs> Michael <laughs> Dell talks about the power of AI and Dell's role in it. Microsoft has their build conference going on this week in Seattle. Microsoft expands AI plugins and co-pilot ecosystem for developers. Google debuts new generative AI advertising tool. This is just what's on the front page of SiliconANGLE. Yeah. And Adobe uses generative fill for Photoshop to add more fake information. 
Apple Inc.'s multi-billion dollar deal with Broadcom for wireless components, and then and NVIDIA's in the news, and there's more in there. So again, dominating the headlines is this AI, and you know, it's going to get you know, dangerous. I think misinformation, pollution, contamination, you're going to start to see some real fast side effects of, you know, even in the media business, Paul, I mean, AI is going to, you get voices for hosts, you know. You know I was joking the other day, maybe I'm a panel, and someone says, John, ask a good question. I mean, do we even, <laughs> like, <laughs> hologram. So, this is interesting time right now. The good, bad, and the ugly is going to rear its head, yet there'll be unicorns born here, right? There's going to be a Absolutely. startup that's going to come out Absolutely. and say, you know what? I'm going to solve these problems. So to me, that's kind of my optimistic side of me, that in all these waves, there's a new brand, there's a young Steve Jobs out there, young Bill Gates dropping out of college, and saying, you know what? I'm going to solve this problem. And it actually takes territory off an incumbent who's too slow. Uh, th this is kind of an internet moment, you know, and I remember back to 1994, the first time I saw the World Wide Web, and, 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 and people's minds were blown. Uh, they just could see that this was going to be a game changer, and I think the same thing is happening with AI right now. Well, and you think about the web, remember the reaction, because I was at Hewlett Packard at the time, and um, a guy that I became friends with, with invented HTML, and his partner invented HTTP, that was Tim Berners-Lee and Dave Raggett. They were like guys coming out of CERN, they moved to MIT for the W3C, and at that time, even Hewlett Packard had a scientist on loan, and they still missed the web. They poo-pooed it. And other people were like, it's a toy, it's not really real, yeah. it's too slow, mm -hmm. AOL. Mm -hmm. So there was massive criticism. It wasn't fear, it was more like, it's not real. I mean, Ken Olsen even said, well, DC was a toy. So in every shift, there's always going to be some detraction. Here, I think it's just fear. I think it's just general fear. No one's saying, it's not going to happen. They're more like, it's going to happen, we don't know what to do. Well, they knew the you web know. was going to happen, but they were no trying, one was afraid they, of it. They were, they were taking a pro, they, it was a proprietary approach. So you had CompuServe and Prodigy and and uh, um, yeah, uh, well, Washington yeah. Post and all these guys who were building these closed wall gardens. What made the web work was that it was open. Bingo. And now with open source, how would you describe the modern times now? I mean, it's a little bit different. Yeah. Different equation. You get open source. You get cloud scale. Yeah, I, I think open open generally wins because it's transparent. And I, I think that with this and with open source AI coming, I think there will be some transparency. Like we said, we were talking about, you know, a couple weeks back, you know, with the meta leak and some of the stuff that Google's been saying and the Google you know, memo. Yeah, the Google memo and uh, meta leaking their their you know, algorithm, their models, and stuff like that. I mean, yeah, I mean, the, the, when they use the word moats, yes, moat to me means proprietary, yeah. it means sustainable competitive advantage, which means some sort of lock in. Yeah. Right. And so, like, you know, Matt Hicks, he's an open source guy, Red Hat's all based on open source. So, if open source becomes its own, like, ecosystem industry company, it's going to have walled gardens or, like, ecosystems. So, the question is, yeah. I mean, that's possible, I'm, saying that. I'm not saying it is, but if that happens, the, the group thing could create islands. So I think the connective tissue between these ecosystems and open source is going to be, to me, the tell sign. I mean, I, I don't know what else to say, but it, I, I get scared when I hear moat. <laughs> you know, moat means, you know, yeah. sustainable competitive <laughs> advantage, which used to be proprietary lock-in, Paul. You but, know? I mean, I just think that, I think that conversation is over. I mean, uh, you made the point today, Rob. I mean, open source has won. That doesn't mean there won't be proprietary products and, and uh, you know, the, the pri proprietary will go out of existence, but uh, the natural pull of the market now is toward open, yeah. and that seems to me to be an unstoppable force. Yeah, yeah, I mean, you can even see it with the announcements today with, uh, again, you know, developer hub and looking at backstage as being that opening to take away the control plane out of the hyperscalers. I mean, that's why Spotify yeah. originally went that route, and it's why Walmart is doing what they're doing, and it's it's a huge way to untangle from those control planes. I, I think that I think of this, these new dynamics that you were mentioning about Walmart, and then we talk about Uber. We have end users who are actually part of. They're not vendors; they're contributing. So yeah. I think you're going to see cohorts emerge where the big companies who have the problem solve it together, that might change the game. But 
also Red Hat has changed. They're not just a software company in open source, they're developing an ecosystem. You guys had Stephanie on. Yeah. They got partners now. They have a global network and they're going for the global distributed computing play, which is they got to plug in yeah. other companies. I think, I think Red Hat is having a, a huge impact on the industry writ large, but the cloud in general, because they are out there, they are a force for openness and they are driving this with the cloud providers and they're driving, the, they won't say as much, but I think the, the fact that the cloud providers are warming to the idea of embracing multi-cloud standards. Yeah. Had a, I think a Red Hat has a lot to do with that. I thought that last panel of John Granger, senior vice president, was on with Matt Hicks and Reddy Goodluff from, from um, Anthem, the big customer, speaks volumes of the impact to IBM as well, and you look at what they're talking about here, talking about IBM and Red Hat. Red Hat is always going to be that, that spear for IBM and IBM and John Green is like, look at we are on Amazon. We got an Amazon practice. We got an Azure practice. You can almost see the formation going where they're going to try to be the middleware yeah. for yeah. multi-cloud. Well, multi you even look. It even goes beyond the big three or big four hyperscalers because they also announced some stuff with Oracle recently as well. <laughs> when you start to look at the fact that they have. OVH and others and other uh, clouds and you know BT and if you start to look around, there's still another group of cloud providers. Good point. That is you know 500, 600 strong below them. Mm -hmm. I asked uh, AJ Patel before he left VM, where he was a senior vice president of the software group. Uh, he now left the company, went somewhere else, and uh, I said, hey, you know the super cloud thing, cross cloud, they're calling it cross cloud, um, and and he's like, look, at Johnny, he goes, I'm a middleware guy. <laughs> Like what, what do you think about the hyperclouds? Because Amazon's not promoting multi-cloud, because why would they promote the competition? He goes, they're just the hardware, they being the clouds. Yeah. He called them hardware. That's funny. Mm, okay. Interesting. So, yeah. of course, why would Microsoft and, and IBM, I mean, Microsoft and AWS, why would they want to promote multi-cloud? That's like the PC promoting the Mac. Of course not. Yeah. Of course not. All right, guys, tomorrow, big day. Uh, we're going to be breaking down all the action. Today, the big surprise was a lot of Red Hat and Ansible together, tomorrow's going to be about scale, and as Paul quoted, this is about learning, doing more with less was the theme. They showed a lot of automation, they played some AI cards which looked really strong. Tomorrow's going to be about scale and efficiency, and Edge, we'll be back tomorrow, thanks for watching.